I was a grunt. I had been trained to run towards danger, to not question orders, to appreciate the importance of polishing and precise folding and saluting. Some people might have said that this made me dumb. Well, I would have told those people that they did not know me. I grew up in a town where 60 was old. Poverty and the booze and the drugs which followed in its wake cut short a lot of lives before then. Men and women, hardship did not discriminate in my experience. Prison could seem inevitable for some, and for a while it looked like that was where I was headed. But then I enlisted, and all of a sudden the world had a horizon which stretched further than the gutter. Do you know the most important thing I learned in my basic training? I learned how to hold my head up high. So yes, sir, that was me. I was 21 and I was stationed in a base a long way from anywhere. There was nothing to see beyond the perimeter of the base other than desert. I liked it out there. At night, the sky was a wonder of stars and the days were spent in the routines of training. We all knew the call might come at any time for us to up sticks and head to one of the dozen hot spots around the world where trouble was brewing. We would be going as peacemakers, but a stray bullet didn't see the difference between a soldier sent to help protect and one there to invade. Whatever situation we found ourselves in, we would be ready. Beyond the training, downtime was excellent. The food in the mess was the best that I had ever eaten. There is a cinema on base which had all the latest movies. And I was not too keen on the endless procession of superheroes, but I loved settling down to watch alien monsters getting their backsides kicked by wisecracking dudes. I didn't have a girl back home, but I had met someone on base. Kirsty was a 23 and a medic. Relationships between soldiers on base was against the rules, but as long as we were careful, it was fine. Still, there were times that I felt like a teenage boy sneaking through his sweetheart's bedroom window, all the while waiting for a dad to come out and start hollering. All in all, life was a breeze. It was not until the orders came through about Camp Adams that things started to twist out of shape. Camp Adams was a former military base sighted to the east of us. It was a two-hour drive and I felt every rattle as the truck transporting us there crossed the rock-strewn desert. There were no road and no signs. Earlier that day when the orders were issued, the officer addressing us told us that Camp Adams had been decommissioned in 1952 and that it was now derelict. That we had been assigned to guard duties at the camp and would be departing in an hour. And if you wanted to know anything more, write a letter home and ask your folks because that was all. We snapped to salute. I had been hoping to meet up with Kirsty later. I was a mean, lean fighting machine, but I was still flesh and blood and I must admit, I was getting pretty sweet on that girl. I felt low because it looked like I wouldn't be seeing her that day after all. So, it was with a mixture of sadness about my girl and curiosity about the abandoned base to which I was being sent, that I hurried to get kitted up. By the time we arrived, my spine was begging for mercy. I climbed tentatively out of the back of the truck and I looked around. Razor wire ran along the top of the mesh fans. Rust had darkened the metal in places, but the barbs still looked like they would gash skin clean open. A gap in the fence, which appeared to have been freshly cut, was our way in. Our Nyko lined us up and marched us in. There were only ten of us and we were all pretty raw. This was the first time I felt like I was not in a training scenario, and my nerves were tingling as we entered a warren of derelict buildings. Their windows were smeared with decades of dirt. A faded signpost affixed to the top of a wooden pole showed the way to the mess and the quartermasters and the infirmary, and I tried to imagine the place bustling with troops, orders being shouted, and announcements made over the loudspeakers, which still rose above the rooftops. They had been silent for 70 years now, I thought, 
and then I told myself to focus on the here and now. We had reached what had clearly once been a parade ground. A flagpole stood proud and empty at the far side. The man next to me shielded his eyes from the sun as he peered up at it, and then he muttered, What are we meant to be guarding? He had a point. This place was a dump. After being kept standing there for half an hour, an officer strode out, a second lieutenant. Sweat patches under his armpits ruined his otherwise immaculate uniform. When he addressed us, it was clear his path here had not started in some poverty-stricken backwater. There was no slurring and no spitting as this soldier spoke. Good afternoon, he said. I am delighted to welcome you to the latest exciting chapter in the life of Camp Adams. For you see, no longer shall it be a wasteland, but it will rise up again when a new base is constructed on these grounds. It'll be the first annex to the base that you are currently stationed at, and we have the honor to protect the site, while I have the honor to command you. He finished up and stood waiting. His expectant expression made me wonder if he thought his little speech would be met by three cheers. As it was, there was silence punctuated only by a couple of the men breaking wind. His cheeks reddened. He cleared his throat and said, Yes, quite. Sergeant, please allocate the men to their sentry posts. And then he walked off. A little less swagger in him now. Man, we were divided up and rationed out to stand guard around the rundown remains of Camp Adams. To ensure they look forbidding on guard duty, soldiers adopt a stern expression. There is strictly no smiling. As I took up my position, by what looked to me like a pile of rubble, I found this came naturally. This whole thing struck me as a lousy and pointless waste of time, but I had my orders. I stared steely-eyed into the distance, and I daydreamed about a medic with the prettiest blue eyes. I saw nothing for the first tedious hours of my shaft and then a man wearing a hazmat suit walked past. It must have been like an oven inside one of them suits was my first thought. And then a concern started to tickle at me. Was there some dangerous substance here? I mean, why else would someone be wearing a hazmat suit? I suddenly felt very exposed. My worries multiplied when two more figures wearing hazmat suits appeared. They were followed by a high-mobility engineer excavator, which rumbled up to the nearby rubble and started to scoop it away. I maintained my position, until someone higher up than me in the army food chain dismissed me. I had no choice but to stand there and keep my fears to myself. Another officer was supervising the work of the truck and directing the men in the hazmat suits. He wore the golden oak leaf of a major and he was yelling at everyone in sight to up the pace. As the rubble was cleared, the outline of a building was revealed, and it struck me that the rubble could have been the walls and roof of whatever had once stood there. Had I wondered, the building had been demolished so that they had collapsed inwards. Explosive charges set in the right place would have achieved this. Stuck on guard duty, passively observing the hive of activity around me. I had nothing better to do than speculate if this was the case and wonder why. The excavator was scraping away more debris from the ground, the operator showing a fantastic dexterity as he worked. All the while, the major was yelling, until the excavator revealed an opening in the ground. He paused when it did, a bug-eyed look of anticipation on his face. I could see the beginning of steps in the hole, leading down to a basement level, I guessed. I watched as the men in the hazmat suits descended the steps. My imagination continued to raise, now wondering about what might be down there. The minutes ticked by. I had been stood still long enough for the desert bugs to work out that I was an easy target. There was something crawling up the inside of my trouser leg. Something else buzzy next to my left ear. I swatted, one hand on each past in one swift, coordinated movement. Got you. I sat under my breath and smiled. With the excavator now parked up and the major pacing, there was nothing else happening. 
until the scream. It was hoarse and muffled. It had come from somewhere down in the hole, and there was no mistaking the terror in it. Whoever had called out was badly scared and potentially in danger. I looked at the major, figuring that he would snap into action and issue orders to go help whoever was in trouble, but he looked like he had frozen. Showing initiative can get you in serious trouble, so I hesitated, and then a second scream rose from below. I could not ignore this. I swore and ran towards it, scrabbling over the displaced rubble and on and into the hole. I was immediately operating close to blind in the darkness which enveloped me as I descended, and then I saw the beam of a torchlight and three figures huddled close to a wall. Two of the men in the hazmat suits were holding down the other man. He was struggling and shouting, They're still here! Still here! He yelled. One of the men restraining him must have heard my boots striking the ground. He whirled around and looked at me. Help us get him out of here, he shouted. Yes, sir, I replied, and the three of us carried the distressed man back to the surface. It was only when we had placed him on the ground, away from the hole in the rubble, and that I had stepped back that it struck me. I had gone down without any protective equipment. If there was hazardous material down there, I would have been exposed to it. The Major had snapped out of whatever haze had possessed him, and had come over and was peering down at the man in the hazmat suit lying on the ground. Permission to seek medical attention, sir? I asked him. The Major turned to me. After my man has been seen to, he said. My heart sank, but I wasn't surprised. When you're the lowest of the low, being at the back of the queue comes naturally. The Major, meanwhile, had turned to the other men in the hazmat suits. What happened? He asked. We became separated, the first replied. The second added in. The next thing we knew he was crying out. It sounded like he saw. The Major cut him off. Need to know, he asked. Now, let's get him to a medic. I want him back on his feet and back down there ASAP. We carried him over to a jeep adorned with the decals of the medical corp. To my surprise, Kirsty was sitting in the driver's seat. My spirit soared and I bit my tongue. I could not tell her how happy I was to see her. Not till the next time that we were alone. She climbed out of the jeep and saluted the major and the second lieutenant, who must have been alerted by the screaming as well. But he had taken his time making an appearance, I thought cynically. The major stared at Kirsty and said, I am sharing this with you purely so that you can treat him. His suit may have been compromised, and there is the possibility that he has been exposed to the remnants of an unknown chemical agent, and this is causing hallucinations. Kirsty took this in calmly, professionally. The second lieutenant looked like someone had poured a bucket of ants into his army pants. Are we talking about biological weapons? He asked. If we are, I insist we pull back to a safe distance. A sneer creased the Major's face. There was an incident here in 1952 which led to the base being abandoned. The incident was and remains classified top secret. However, I've been given special access to reports that talk about outstanding progress and cutting-edge research that would benefit defense and offensive operations. This activity was halted by the incident and I am here to carry on where they left off. I believe the work carried out here 70 years ago can help us develop new assets which we can use to fight the enemies of our great nation. The second lieutenant looked like he was about to puke. What about the annex? He asked. The construction work? The major's voice was brutally cold when he replied. There is a mission which will proceed. You have your duty to do, soldier. He left, the last word hanging. Disobeying a senior officer meant a one-way trip to the guardhouse and at the end of a promising military career. The second lieutenant stood attention and saluted. Yes, sir, he said. The major returned the salute with a lazy motion of his hand and said, Now look lively. We're going back in, as a full compliment this time. While the second lieutenant rounded up the rest of the soldiers, 
Kirsty checked out the man in the hazmat suit who had lost it earlier. There are no signs that he's been poisoned, she told the major when she had finished. But I would recommend he be removed from active duty until we get back to base and run tests. The major clearly did not give this any consideration. Nonsense, he told her. If he can stand, he can work. And then he turned to the driver of the excavator, who was leaned against his machine, smoking a cigarette. And you, man, the major hollered at him. You're coming with us as well. The driver's expression was a picture of disdain, but he did as he was told. We all did and were soon making our way single file down the steps. Only Kirsty was left behind. The darkness was cut open by the crisscrossing beams of torches. The three men in the hazmat suits led the way. The officers followed. The second lieutenant was visibly shaking. Was he wondering as I was what we might be breathing in? My chest felt tight and beads of sweat trickled down my face even though it was cooler down here than out on the surface. I wiped my hand across my brow and tried to focus as we made our way along corridors lined with small rooms. Through dust-coated windows, I saw lab equipment and display boards. A tweed jacket hung on a coat rack in one of the rooms. A magazine lay on a table in another, its pages curled up with age. We were crowded together, restricted. I wasn't claustrophobic, but my sense of unease was rising. There were too many unknowns, not least the classified incident. I need to know. I grumbled to myself as we shuffled forwards along yet another corridor. It stretched out into a new darkness. One of the men in hazmat suits placed his torch along its length and then cried out, I told you. I told you. The major snapped back. Do not lose discipline. If the man in the hazmat suit heard, he paid no heed. He was pointing into the corridor. It's there, can't you see it? New torch beams reached out and yes, I could see. Movement. A dark shape. Something had passed along the end of the corridor. And whatever it was, it was heading away from us. The Major had seen this as well. Follow it, he ordered. The man in the hazmat suit who had spoken was clearly having none of this. He pulled off his helmet. His skin was pale and he looked close to tears. No, he said. We have to get out of here right now. They are here. The Major opened his mouth, about to throw out another command, when the first of them appeared. There! The soldier who had seen it first whispered, and we all turned. It was in one of the rooms, bathed now in torchlight. The man who had cried out was staring wide-eyed at it, a scream stillborn in his open mouth. It was an aberration. It must have been a man once, before its skin had decayed and fallen away, before its blood-red eyes had sunken into the hollows of its face. What the? One of the men said quietly, it heard and turned its hideous gaze towards him. Its lower jaw hung loosely, attached only by wiry threads of flesh. But even so, it seemed to be trying to speak. A hoarse and gurgling whisper drifted from its shriveled lips. You left us, it said. Abandoned us. We stood, shot, paralyzed by fear. You left us. It murmured in its sickening way. It left us while our hunger grew, but now we shall feed. In the wake of its words, the second lieutenant grabbed the major's arm and said, What do we do? The major did not respond. Once again, he seemed frozen, incapable to lead. I heard safety catches being released, saw barrels being raised, fingers poised. The other soldiers, my comrades, were waiting on their orders, but knew as I did that we needed to act, and act now, before it was too late. It had not moved, the thing, but its gaze seemed to have drifted, to be looking over us into the darkness that remained. Moments later, I saw why. A half dozen more of the things were coming into view, 
Their bodies had decay away in places and the bone was clearly visible through gaping holes in their flesh. They moved slowly at first and then they began to run, a tide of monsters racing at us, their teeth bared and their eyes filled with hate. They dug their fingers into the arms of the first soldiers that they had reached, snapped closed their jaws over shoulders, necks and hands, desperately trying to fight them away. No triggers were pulled. It was happening too quickly and we were crammed so closely together. Soldiers began to howl with agony. One, a few feet to my left, was still screaming as one of the things tore through his scalp and then it dashed his head against the wall, smashing open his skull. And then it began to eat. I looked away. I was shaking, terrified, and all around me, it had intensified. Torches spewed their light, illuminating grotesque acts as the things feasted. Torches lay on the floor, dropped by fingers now twitching as more warm flesh was ripped from bone. I saw out of the corner of my eye that the Major had found a gap through everything, and he was slipping away. I followed. At that point, survival was my only goal. The Major darted into a room and was about to slam the door when he saw me coming, and he started to slam it anyway. I lashed out with my boot and forced my way in. He closed the door and dragged a table across to block it. Through the window, I could see the horror that raged on. The things had not seen us. Yet. I whirled around to the Major. I had always had respect for my seniors in the service before but right then I had none left. He had failed the men under his command and they were paying with their lives. I took a deep breath and tried to think straight. I needed intel if I was going to get out of here, I figured, and there was only one person who could give it to me. I grabbed the major by the throat and pressed him against the window. Talk, I growled at him. He would not look me in the eye as he spoke. It was all in the reports that I saw. The work's aim was to keep troops active even if killed. It succeeded. After exposure to an experimental gas, death was no longer the end. The soldiers remained an asset. They could fight on. I was horrified by what I heard, but I had to know more and asked. Those things out there, are they the soldiers that were exposed to the gas? Yes, he answered. Disgust burnt inside me. I swallowed down bile that had risen into the back of my mouth and asked, And I have been exposed to the gas. Am I going to become like them? If you were, it would have happened by now, he answered. Many traces of gas left must be negligible by this stage and... He didn't finish speaking. The glass in the window behind his head smashed. Decayed hands wrapped around the Major's throat. His eyes were wide with fear and helplessness. I watched as he was dragged through the broken window, and the things fell on top of them, and they began to feed. They were in a frenzy. I would be next, I knew. And to them, I was nothing but raw meat. And now, that they had finished with the Major and were looking up at me, one of them raised itself to its full height. Fresh blood dripped from its teeth and face. It opened its mouth wider, ready to attack. The sound of the shot was followed, a heartbeat later, by the sight of the thing's head exploding into a cloud. It toppled forward and fell. The thing next to it looked over its shoulder, and a second shot filled the air, and its head was taken apart. Everything dripped down the side of the walls as it collapsed onto the ground. The cavalry, it appeared, had arrived just in time, and they were taking more of the things out one by one with rapid, razor-sharp hits to their head. I stood there hypnotized by what I was seeing, and I couldn't speak when I saw who the cavalry was. Stepping over the bodies of the things was a young woman. Kirsty's hair and face were speckled with the remains. She smiled and said, That's how you kill a zombie. I think I smiled back just before we embraced. Minutes later, we were emerging back out of the hole. The last light of the day was bleeding into the distant horizon. I looked at Kirsty. 
We need to call this in, I said. But before we do, let's go absent without leave. Just long enough to gaze at a few stars and embrace being alive. I would have a lot of exploiting to do to a lot of people. And maybe I would be thrown out of the army or even imprisoned. At that moment in time, I found it hard to care. And we climbed into the jeep and drove away. The night was ours. Everything else would have to wait.